Mark, I'm delighted to have with us today some presenters from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau there with the Office of Financial Education. And they'll be talking about principles for effective financial education. Irene Skricky is Senior Financial Education Program Analyst in the Office of Financial Education. And uh, prior to this position, which she's, she's held this position since 2011, and her focus is promoting effective practices in the financial education field. We're so delighted to have her. Previous to this, Irene was with the uh, Annie E. Casey Foundation. And we also have with us today, Maria Jaramillo, Jaramillo, Financial Education Program Analyst, also with the Office of Financial Education. She is um, uh, works with the Open Credit Score Initiative in collaboration with colleagues and other divisions within the Bureau. She's currently Senior Manager Content Strategy and Business Development at Microfinance Opportunities. So welcome both of you from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Great, well thank you very much, um, Mark and Laura, and we're thrilled to be here. Um, I'm Irene Scricky, I'm the one on the left uh, of the screen, <laughs> and uh, Maria next to me is Hello. on the right. Um, this Thank is our you. first webinar where we've been visible, so we're going to have to really behave ourselves. And know, you know, bunny ears over each other. Oh. So stuff we usually do in webinars, we will we will skip. So what I'm going to do now is, if I can pull this off, uh, we're going to share our screen. But again, today we're going to talk about our brand new principles for financial education. Um, let's see, is this the best yeah, one? Yeah. Okay. You. So first, we as government employees, we always have to do our uh, sort of standard disclaimer that we're um, representing the bureau, but we're not giving legal advice, guidance, or interpretation. And any views uh, or opinions stated are are ours rather, and may or may not represent the bureau's views. So I always start with that. Uh, probably most of you, hopefully many, if not most of you, if not all of you, know what the CFPB is. But the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is a uh, now about six-year-old federal agency. Um, uh, whose purpose is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. And it's really that last piece around empowering consumers that is the work we will talk about today and the part of the Bureau that Maria and I are in. Um, and uh, specifically in the consumer-facing side of the Bureau, um, uh, the division is called Consumer Education and Engagement. We have a number of special population offices that serve, for example, older Americans, military service members, students, et cetera. Um, and then we're in financial education, which really looks across all populations um, to help people uh, make better informed financial decisions. Um, though we work closely with all the other um, offices uh, here, as well as other parts of the Bureau, to carry out that mission. So that's just a bit of background. The one other piece of background I will just give is that, uh, and I think at least a few of you are already involved in this, but we do have a one project we have, which is really uh, to help connect us to financial educators of all types, including folks like all of you, um, by getting our own materials out to you all, um, learning back from you, what you're learning, what's working, what isn't working, what trends you're seeing, um, and try to also help better connect the financial education field. And that is the CFPB Financial Education Exchange, or Finex. I know this is rather a busy slide, but I just wanted to kind of put it up there. Uh, to let you know that uh, this is something that you can join. All we need is an email address. You'll get a monthly newsletter. Um, it's not a scary thing to join. Um, and we have an, we do webinars as well, um, as do all of you guys, of course, uh, uh, which are recorded also. You can listen to them. Um, we have uh, also periodic uh, meetings around the country and other uh, surveys, ways we learn back from you. So if any of you are not in it, um, feel free to email. There's an email address at the bottom of the screen, CFPB underscore finex at cmpb.gov. That will also be on our very last slide. Um, so if you would like to, to join, just shoot an email, say you want to sign up, and we will add you to that list. And through that, you would get updates uh, monthly on things like the principles we're going to talk about today, which came out just a couple weeks ago. It's our sort of our newest um, piece. So, um, so we will dive into the principles. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give a little bit of background first about how we develop the principles. Uh, and then Maria, who is really one of the main authors of the report that we'll talk about, will actually describe the principles in more detail. Uh, and then we'll uh, you know, be obviously very eager to hear your thoughts and questions and feedback and all of that. So um, uh, some of this uh, may be familiar because we've actually been sort of uh, talking about these principles in draft form for a while and consulted with a number of practitioners in the field. So some of you may have heard about this. but 
the, the report we're going to discuss today, we released just uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're very excited about it. Um, these principles um, are uh, designed to uh, provide um, thoughts, suggested strategies, practitioner tips um, for all of you in the field. So this is really um, based on uh, research into financial well-being, which I'll say more about in just a minute, as a common goal of financial education. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that, um, but um, these principles really talk about how to put financial well-being into real-world practice in the financial education field. Um, secondly, the principles, the goal of the principle is also to promote effective financial education by demonstrating how financial education can work uh, by laying out specific mechanisms that can help people take actions to improve their financial well-being. So it's really about action. And then thirdly, um, we, uh, the goal are also, is also to highlight strategies that can help consumers build financial capability and make progress on their goals. So really looking at some of the actual effective practices being uh, used by many of you already. Um, and just to note, we take a very broad view of what financial education is. Uh, it can take place in classrooms, in one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, or online, it can be delivered through peers, through new communication technologies, even through products that act as on-ramps to, to financial uh, to knowledge and action. Uh, and so our strategies are, will uh, look at a lot of different ways that uh, folks can do financial education. So those are the goals. Um, we want to note um, that these principles that we're about to describe, uh, not what's on your screen, should not be confused with the work that others have done to identify features of high quality financial education or education of any type really shown here. These are some things about being unbiased, accessible, evidence-based, having quality standards, um, being appropriate, et cetera, that are things that the financial education field has um, been uh, implementing and developing um, over the last, you know, several decades. Uh, and we think these are all important, very important, and we want to affirm the importance of all of these and note that the principles we're about to share really are meant to rest on top of these other features. So these are all incredibly important um, as well, and we want to kind of build on build on the work that the field has already done. Before I reveal the principles, um, we also want to just note how you can use them up front, so you kind of help understand our purpose too. Um, the principles are really focused on supporting financial action. So what we mean by effective financial education is not just um, delivering information, but rather offering knowledge, skills, and pathways to help people take the right action, whatever is right for, for that consumer. And so we hope that you will find the principles useful in um, identifying promising strategies uh, to help consumers improve their well-being, um, potentially looking at your own program to see how your own program fits into the framework, and then potentially uh, give you new insights to refine, um, refine your own efforts um, as appropriate. So, without further ado, here is a preview of the principles. Um, we're going to describe each in greater detail later, but just uh, I'll just quickly run through them. Um, first, know the individuals and families to be served. Uh, effective financial education starts with recognizing the real goals, opportunities, and obstacles of the people you're trying to serve in determining realistically what can be accomplished through education, and then tailoring your program and definition of success accordingly. So that's the first principle. Principle two, provide actionable uh, and relevant timely information. This really says that when it comes to money matters, information is more likely to stick if it is something people can act on, if it is relevant to the individual, and given at a moment in time when it can be used. Uh, the third principle is improve key financial skills. And here we're looking at sort of the how-to um, we've identified specific skills that seem to matter most and uh, that are transferable to with all the financial decisions that people may face. The fourth principle is build on motivation, and that is looking at um, uh, 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 how you can help someone when a person has the know-how and the opportunity to do something but needs to strengthen their, as we call it, motivational muscle. So we'll say more about that. Um, and then the fifth and final one is really just emerging in the financial education field. And that says we should find ways to make it easier for people to make good decisions and follow through on them. Um, uh, for a simple example, um, after all the effort you might put in to help someone build knowledge, uh, skill and motivation, say about doing something like paying bills, um, signing up for automated reminders can help them put that know-how into action by making uh, uh, consistent, timely um, payments uh, and the reminders make it easier to follow through. So you'll, you'll hear more about that later. Um, so just so you know, everything that we're going to talk about today is in the paper that came out like about two weeks ago, Effective Financial Education 
Uh, you can see a screenshot of it up there on the left. Um, there is also a two-page summary uh, see it on the right, that's a kind of quicker, easier way to uh, share the principles with folks. Uh, and they're all at the URL down the bottom. Now again, we'll have that up again at the end, and if you go to our website, consumerfinance.gov, um, they're, not, they're not too hard to find if you even just use the search function to say effective financial education. Um, but um, this is available for you to uh, read and peruse on your own. So. Now I'm going to, before we dive deeper into the principles, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we develop these principles so you have some background on them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the starting point for these principles was really what we've learned over the past five years about financial well-being. And again, something some of you may have uh, heard about um, that we've kind of been releasing over the last couple of years, but uh, we've really uh, worked to learn what financial well-being is, what factors allow people to have more of it, and what those factors imply about how financial education can help consumers. So I won't say a lot about the development process for financial well-being, but essentially we had um, open-ended one-on-one interviews with consumers around the United States uh, and learned or de de developed this definition of financial well-being with four elements, which correspond to a person's sense of financial security. Um, uh, and freedom of choice about the present and the future. Four-part definition about control over your day-to-day -day finances, capacity to absorb a financial shock, financial freedoms to make the choices uh, to enjoy life, and on track to meet your financial goals. Um, uh, we've also um, developed a way to measure this, a financial well-being scale, which we won't talk about today, but just so you know that it's out there and maybe something that you want to learn more about. Um, so what influences financial well-being? Uh, the next step in our project was to research the factors, both personal and situational, that support higher levels of financial well-being so that we could design and promote financial education strategies with those factors in mind. Um, this diagram, uh, I call it the, um, the, uh, 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 the room uh, a floor plan. It looks like a floor plan to me. That's not what it's supposed to be, but it does look like a floor plan. Um, and it's meant to graphically kind of depict the, some of the things that go into well-being. So well-being is on the right sort of how satisfied you are with your financial situation. Um, and uh, that is um, most, most immediately influenced by the actions you take, behavior, which is just a little bit to the left of that, as well as by the options and opportunities available to people. So that opportunity is down the bottom. So um, you have to uh, take action uh, based on the opportunities that you have. What goes into behavior, um, we uh, talk about as being a combination of um, personality and attitudes, decision context, and knowledge and skills. That's that kind of middle box there in the uh, floor plan. Um, and uh, sorry, um, and I'll just note that by decision context, we'll say more about that later, but that is referring to the literature on the power of the situation to influence behavior and choices. Uh, and then all of these on the far left, of course, are influenced by any individual's current and past social and economic environment. That's very important, where you grew up, the resources you have available, all of the, you know, all of those, uh, those things like education and income and jobs and other things that really matter to how someone manages. So all of those things uh, together are important. And our research into this part of the project really was focusing on that middle box around the specific types of behavior, knowledge, and personal attributes that seem to support financial well-being given, uh, given a certain level of opportunity. So we applied all of these findings to um, think about how financial educators can help consumers take action over their financial lives. And so, yes, it's another diagram, um, but in this, this sort of building on that is the uh, what we call the model of financial action. So we distilled all our findings from financial well-being down into this model of really what allows a, a consumer to take a specific financial action. So first, the person needs to know how to do it. That's knowledge. That's the top green circle that you see there, which is their knowledge and skills. Um, but you know, know-how alone isn't enough, as I'm sure you've all seen in your work. People also need um, they need uh, uh, they need to have the motivation uh, to actually act on that, which is related to attitudes and beliefs about the value of taking the action one's ability to succeed, all of those things. So motivation is that second circle on the left. Uh, and then lastly, they need to have the opportunity. Again, they need to have access to the products or other, other um, uh, ways in which they could actually take action. When you put all those three things together, you get financial action. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the basis on which uh, we're looking at the, the principles of how to help people take action by looking at those pieces. Um, 
So the last, this is the last diagram, I promise. Uh, this just kind of sums up broadly uh, what I was just talking about, about how we put together the principles or came up with the principles. Um, you know, first there's the financial well-being research, which I described initially, then the model of financial action, which I just described in three circles. Um, those helped us come up with the five principles. Um, we then looked into how to implement those um, by uh, doing a literature review of, of what works and doesn't work about the research in the financial education field, financial capability field, um, uh, and also talking to both leading financial education stakeholders, but also practitioners. Um, in particular, we uh, reached out to the Phoenix community, the network that I, I mentioned when I first started, and invited practitioners from around the country to provide feedback last fall on initial draft of the principles, and also to share strategies and tips of how they have implemented uh, the strategies in their own work. And you'll hear all that um, in the next part of the presentation. So all of those four green little green boxes went into the report and the, and the principles that you're about to hear more about. So that was a lot of background, but I hope it gives you at least a little sense of where we, where we came from. And again, I just want to emphasize that all of this really builds on the work financial educators have already done. It's based on research on the work you all do. It's based on practitioner feedback from people like you, possibly even some of you actually on, on, on the webinar. So we want to thank everyone for, for all the work you do and all the, um, the things that have kind of fed into these, these um, principles. We hope they will be helpful and kind of reflect the work that you are doing and want to be doing. So I'm now going to turn it over to Maria. She is going to talk about the principles, but I will pop in at the end of each principle to say just a word about some CFPB tools that fit under those principles. So turn it to Maria, but um, I will I will still be here. Thanks, Mary. Great. So as Irene mentioned, principle one underscores the, uh, the point that programs can be more successful when they take into account the challenges, the opportunities, and the goals that each consumer wants to achieve. Um, Part of the literature review that we carried out, I, we identified that a growing body of research indicates that different programs can be effective for different consumers depending on their circumstances and where they are. Therefore, um, it, it is better not to treat financial education as a one-size-fits-all approach, but instead to adapt it and tailor it to the specific reality, goals, and challenges of each consumer. Um, so we think that this principle is very important also to, to have a realistic assessment of what you can achieve with financial education because some of the drivers, uh, some of the challenges uh, that your co consumers might be facing might go beyond what you can address through a financial education program. And then finally, we think that following this principle can also be valuable uh, because as you look at their challenges, goals, and opportunities, this can be used to tailor the program that you're designing to better fit their needs. So we think that the model of financial action can be used as a diagnostic tool to support this principle of knowing your customers' needs and realities. Uh, for example, you can start by identifying what, what is their goal, what are they trying to achieve in terms of their financial life, for example, buying a house. Um, so then you can go through the model um, and ask, for example, does your customer have the knowledge that they need to take the desired action? How much information is needed? And how do we link the information we'll provide to their desired financial goal? You can then inquire and ask what skills are required? And does the customer know how to do the things or know how to take the steps needed to achieve that desired goal? You can then ask if your customer feels confident in knowing how to take the steps or knowing how to do these things effectively? Do they believe that they can do these things and that doing them is valuable for them? And finally, you can inquire if your customer um, has the opportunity to apply their know-how, or if they will encounter a decision context that is conducive to taking the actions that they need to achieve their desired goal. So we think that answers to these questions can help you identify what gaps exist in the journey that your clients are taking as they try to achieve financial well-being, or what are the obstacles that are getting in the way. So as I re-mentioned to further develop these, the principles, we scanned the growing body of program evaluation research and um, to identify uh, approaches and strategies that have been proven to put into practice the ideas of each principle and that have been shown to be effective. So for principle one, 
we, have, we identify that starting with a needs assessment can lead to better results. Um, for example, a workplace uh, financial education program used a pretest to assess the needs of employees. They then used this information to tailor content accordingly. And the program was effective in um, increasing the likelihood of employees starting or updating a budget, increasing their retirement contributions, or decreasing negative financial behaviors such as late bill pays. And another um, approach we identified was that personalized approaches like financial coaching can be powerful. So uh, for each principle, I'll mention strategies like this too and elaborate a little bit on what they entail. But in the report, you can find studies that um, a description of the studies that we used and also the impact that these programs have had. And that can be found under each principle in the section that is called what we know about work, what works. Then, as I mentioned, we also um, had a convening of the CFPB Financial Education Exchange, where we invited financial education practitioners from around the country to provide feedback on the principles. So the strategies that practitioners shared with us for putting into action principle one included focus on client-driven goals, one-on-one -on -one engagements, practice active listening, avoid judgment, connect with individuals, serve, and be empathetic. Here's where I jump back in, which I'll do for each principle. We just wanted to show really quickly, we won't say much about these for each principle example of some of the CFPB tools that uh, can be can be used kind of on that principle or reflect that principle. And here I just we're just noting um, a, a several resources that are available again for anyone to use and download and order uh, with your clients to, to really um, help in this in this case. Um, immigrant communities uh, or uh, newcomers to the financial system, be they uh, folks from other countries or um, uh, people new to the workforce, like young workers. So the resources for financial, uh, the financial education program serving immigrant populations is a paper and compendium of programs that we put out about a year or two ago, uh, talking about how financial education can be tailored for specific communities. Uh, and then the newcomers guides, you see there's four of them up there, are again ways to help people uh, new to the financial system, um, better understand um, how to receive money, different ways to pay bills, selecting financial products and services. Uh, and so these are ways, again, that you could provide uh, content or information uh, specific uh, to a particular um, uh, community or individual. Okay, so we'll move on to principle two. So the, the core idea behind this principle is how to deliver financial content in a way that can improve actual decision making and behavior. We found that three core elements are crucial for, for delivering content. The first one is actionable. Information delivered to consumers, we think it's most effective when it is highly actionable, including concrete steps needed to achieve their goals. Second, when content needs to be relevant. Um, it's important to relate knowledge to any real life situations where people are making financial decisions and people will be more likely to pay attention and absorb information if it is connected to their motivation to achieve some financial goal. And thirdly, financial education at times is delivered too far away from use and decays with time. So rather it should be delivered close to the point where it will be implemented. If it is timely, people will have a better chance of acting on it while it is, while it is still fresh in their minds. So in regards to what we know about what works and what supports this principle, um, an example of an approach that puts this principle into practice is housing counseling because it provides information about home buying, interest rate, mortgage, or repayment options at a time when people are contemplating buying a home. And several studies have shown the effectiveness of this type of program. We think technology can also be effective for delivering information in small, easily digestible, and timely increments. An innovative approach that was used uh, by a program was to send text messages to youth uh, finishing high school that were planning to enroll in college and to their parents at crucial moments throughout the summer to make sure that they were taking the actions needed to ensure that they would enroll in the fall and the program was also successful. And lastly, uh, pointing people to concrete actionable steps they can take can help translate intentions into actions. And then moving now to what practitioners shared with us in terms of uh, strategies for putting this idea, uh, these ideas into practice included 
uh, break down financial goals into smaller steps, meet people where they are, connect information to individual financial goals, customize or personalize information. Great, and here before I jump in on principle two, looking at a couple of CPB tools that uh, relate to principle two. Uh, one is our uh, owning a home tool, which is an online um, uh, uh, financial education tool around uh, home ownership, how to buy a home, um, all the different steps. One part of that tool is the Explore Interest Rates tool, which actually gives people real-time data on uh, the interest rates offered by financial institutions in their uh, zip code and with a similar credit score and size of a home purchase. So it allows people to kind of get a sense of what interest rate they might get uh, so that when they actually go out and look, they have a sense of what, you know, are they in kind of a reasonable, um, uh, uh, getting a possibly a reasonable rate. So that's very much actionable, relevant, timely information. And then secondly, we have quite a few things um, aimed at people facing a specific situation. So somebody, for example, who wants to rebuild their credit because they have a, a, a issues with their credit history, we have things like the one pager here, how to rebuild your credit, that offers very clear steps on how to do that. Again, so something that is relevant and actionable for folks um, who are facing that situation. Great. Okay, so moving on to principle three, we know that financial capability has an action component that is the skills to put financial knowledge to use. So principle three recommends that financial education supports individuals in learning the how-to of making sound financial decisions and follow-through. We, uh, we have learned that people with strong financial skill know uh, where to start looking for information when they need to make um, a financial decision. And this can include asking a reliable friend that has more knowledge about it, or uh, as Irene was showing, this uh, mortgage comparison um, website, knowing where to find information to, to be able to compare options. Secondly, um, we know that once they obtain information, adults with financial skills know how to process it. For example, they know how to run the numbers to find out which auto loan would be more appropriate for them. And finally, people with financial skills know how to execute and stick to their financial plans over the long term, adjusting as necessary. What we identified was that financial counseling can support learning skills to successfully take or stick with unfamiliar or difficult actions. Um, I'll mention this study because it's very interesting. It was done by the World Bank and they found that individualized counseling help participants undertake difficult actions or tasks they had not done before, such as regularly preparing a budget or opening a bank savings account. We think that we, we have found that opportunities to practice financial behaviors with specialized financial products can help build skills. So rigorous studies have found that individual development accounts, or IDAs, have been effective in fostering savings behavior among households with little prior history for formal savings. And we also found that teaching people to use if-then plans and to piggyback desired behaviors on existing routines can improve follow-through and instill new habits. Let me explain a little bit more what an if-then plan is. So with an if-then plan, an individual identifies likely opportunities or obstacles and then specifies what they would do when the opportunity of the obstacle arises. And this makes it more likely that the person will seize opportunities and not be deterred by obstacles. And finally, simplified, memorable, and actionable guidelines can help people learn new ways of managing money. So a study performed under contract by the CFPB sent catchy email messages to people that carried debt on their, current, on their credit card from month to month, encouraging them to use cash instead of credit for purchases under 20. And this, this simple messages were found to modestly reduce the participant revolving debt on their credit card at a very low cost to implement. So moving on to the practitioner strategies, what we heard from uh, the practitioners that shared ideas with us were, first of all, provide opportunities to practice and experience. Use technology such as expense trackers, goal trackers, or online coaching to help build skills, deliver information, and maintain attention and follow through. Use simulation and experiential learning. Let people practice making financial choices and experience consequences in a safe environment. And lastly, help people learn about why to do research. Demonstrate the value proposition of comparison shopping. For example, that the time that people use to compare products will result in savings. 
And so here, uh, for principle three, a couple of uh, CPB tools that uh, sort of epitomize that, that, that principle are one, our comparing loans auto worksheet. We have a whole set of uh, tools to help people um, uh, uh, get the best auto financing for their situation. And this worksheet actually uh, helps people to calculate the total cost of a loan so they can compare apples to apples. So it's really a way to, um, to have a financial skill of comparison shopping um, uh, across products. And then secondly, the other resource we show here is a goal-focused budgeting workshop, my new worksheet, sorry, My New Money Goal, uh, which can provides a tool to help people create a monthly budget and figure out um, a new goal that they might want to save for uh, and then implement that. Great. So moving on to principle four. What we know is that knowledge and skills alone do not necessarily lead to action. There is often a gap between what people intend to do and what they actually do. Principle four, based on this, recommends helping people build qualities that strengthen their determination to take specific steps to achieve their financial goals. And our research points to three key attitudes or qualities. First, internal frame of reference. Framing desired financial choices and behaviors in terms of one's own standards and goals, so that that would be helping consumers focus on making their financial decisions based on their own values instead of comparing um, to other people. Second of all, perseverance, which is the ability to stay motivated, uh, to stay on track in the face of obstacles, and to understand the value of taking actions necessary to achieve your personal financial goals. And thirdly, the confidence to take action or financial self-efficacy. That is, supporting consumers' belief that they are capable of influencing their financial outcomes and achieve goals they set out for themselves and that the actions necessary to do so are appropriate and possible for them to carry out. What we found out was that framing financial decisions to highlight their connection to a personal important goal can help inspire people to take action. For example, a study had social workers seal a targeted amount of savings in an envelope that had pictures of the household's children. And what the study found that it was effective, households that had the children of their the, the pictures of their children in the envelope were less likely to open and spend the money in the envelope. Uh, we've also uh, identified that financial coaching helps people tap into their own strengths and work toward their goals while building self-efficacy. And this idea that small victories with tangible results can keep people motivated for the long haul. Um, one example is in the case of paying debt, there is evidence that people <coughs> may be more successful if, uh, in paying debt if they start by paying off from the smallest to the largest rather than focus on paying all debt simultaneously. <coughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, we're gonna pass the torch while Maria recovers here for a second. Um, but we've also found that implementation planning, uh, studies show that implementation planning can help people to take the steps needed to accomplish a goal by spelling out in advance where, when, and how they will do what they need to do to reach the goal. Um, and lastly, peer support programs can help create an environment of support and accountability. And again, there's research behind all of these that you can see in um, the paper. Um, then looking at practitioner strategies that we heard, um, people talked about celebrating success uh, celebrating small successes to help um, kind of build momentum, um, really spending time to understand what motivates the person that you're serving, um, uh, starting with one thing and really working on accomplishing a sort of a first step uh, to, again, to build momentum, and then using things like reminders, nudges, and other ongoing supports to help people maintain um, behaviors and um, uh, move closer to achieving their goals. So here's where I would have jumped in anyway, which is, uh, uh, where there's some bureau resources that support building motivation. Maria mentioned several times uh, financial coaching, and we uh, did a rigorous study of financial coaching that resulted in several products, one of which is um, a um, uh, set of insights for practitioners uh, on how to do coaching, the implementing financial coaching report that's up there. So that's uh, a resource that you can use um, to, uh, uh, to work on principle four. And then we also have uh, a set of financial rules to live by worksheets, and this is where People can use these worksheets to create uh, a customized kind of rule of thumb or, or um, goal uh, and lay out an action plan on the back of each sheet as a place to write down your next steps on how to do something. 
uh, and then sign it and sort of make a promise to yourself. So you're kind of motivating yourself by writing down what you're going to do and, and signing the, uh, the Road to Live By worksheet. So those are resources that uh, can help people um, uh, kind of build on motivation to achieve their goals. And Maria is back. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> principle five. Principle five. So we like a lot this principle because we think it adds value to the discussion that people um, that we've been having for many years on how to make financial education more effective. So we know that people's decisions and actions can be influenced by the way choices are presented and by the way we respond to these choices. <clears throat> people's actions are often driven not simply by their own intentions but also by the conditions in which they make and carry out decisions. And often, this is often referred to as the decision context. <clears throat> Under these influences, a person's decisions and actions may actually run counter to their stated overall intent, or at times actually the environment may help us carry out those intentions um, in, in a way that serves us. What is interesting is that many of the situational forces sometimes lie outside a person's control, but sometimes factors can be adjusted or, or tilted in the consumer's favor. So financial educators, for example, can help people create their own pathways to support the actions they want to take, such as setting up a savings account that is harder to withdraw from, lining up due dates for recurring bills with paydays, or setting up automated reminders and alerts to manage spending, or to set up automatic payroll deductions to save toward a goal. We think that financial educators can help shape the decision context on multiple levels. For example, they can make getting financial education easier by identifying, for example, what are the factors that make it harder or easier for people to participate. And this can include adjusting the times and the locations where financial education is being offered to make it more convenient to, your, to the clients you're trying to serve, or by mapping out um, the experience of, of clients as they go through a program in order to identify where, where there is dropout and why uh, customers are not dropping out of the program in order to make adjustments as needed. Secondly, we think educators can help consumers be more aware of how options or pathways are presented to them and how in the marketplace and, and learn how to uh, navigate them in a way that benefits them. And thirdly, we think that um, we can build education into the offering and use of products. Uh, financial education strategies uh, can, can be even more effective when coupled with, with or built into products that facilitate the positive financial outcomes we're, we're hoping to have. So even, um, even small adjustments can help. For example, you can change the options presented and how they're framed or arranged to a customer. You can help remove potential obstacles that might get in the way or add supports that can help people bridge the gap between their intention and actions. Another idea that is crucial to this principle is that there are certain tendencies that can influence the way that we interpret situations that we encounter and the choices that we make when we're faced with them. And we think financial educators can help to take to make consumers more aware of these often invisible forces or tendencies that we have and can design financial education approaches that either overcome these tendencies or leverage them. Let me explain a couple of them in a bit more detail. So, for example, being derailed by, derailed by hassle. If carrying out an intention requires additional steps, people may not follow through. So finding ways to simplify or eliminate additional steps can help people overcome these obstacles. Then sticking with an easy decision. One human tendency we have is to leave things as they are, to stay, stay with the status quo, or to fall back on existing routines, beliefs, or previous choices we make. This tendency can lead people to stick with default options, that is options pre-selected by others, even when they are free to make their own choices. Another one is present bias, which is the tendency that can lead people to more heavily weigh present benefits and costs than those that can be expected in the future. For example, making extra payments on a debt will reduce total interest paid. However, the prospect of having less money to spend in the here and now might deter consumers from doing so. Mental accounting, um, in many cases, individuals and households often assign labels 
to types of funds or expenditures and give them different value or priority for saving or spending depending on the objective and the source of the funds. Even though money is fungible, funds allocated to different accounts are often considered non-transferable. And finally, attention to safety and information. This tendency can lead people to pay attention only to information that is most noticeable. For example, a consumer looking at a credit card offer might notice a low introductory rate presented in larger fonts, but overlook a higher long-term rate buried in small print. So with regards to what we know about what works, we have identified that um, embedding financial education into mandatory training for army enlistees, for example, or into the workplace, or into programs for employment training and income assistance has been effective, has been shown to have uh, positive results compared to uh, participants that went through these programs but did not have the financial education embedded in them. <clears throat> we have also seen that making it easier to access products that support the person's goals. For example, a, a youth employment program in Washington, D.C. made it easier for the youth participating in the program to open accounts and have direct deposit of their salary to the account, and this benefited a, a big percentage of the youth participating in this program. Um, sorry, automatic enrollment um, is this idea, for example, that when you start to work for a company, instead of giving you the option to sign into the 401k plan, that instead you're automatically enrolled in it and, and you can then have the option to opt out of the program. <clears throat> and finally, this, um, this idea that advanced commitment coupled with automated follow through could be effective comes from a study um, implemented by Save, a program implemented by Save for Tomorrow program, which gave employees the option to commit in advance to allocate some of their future pay increases to our retirement savings. Um, the, the program saw that the average savings rate for the for, uh, for program participants increased substantially. What is interesting is that by not reducing the employee's, the employee's current income, the SMART program avoided what we described as the present bias, and it also helped employees overcome hassle factors and inertia by enabling, enabling them to sign up in advance immediately after learning about the program and three months before their next paycheck increase. Great. Um, with regards to the way information is presented to us to promote healthier financial decisions, we found that heightening the salience of key information is crucial. For example, a study uh, presented information about payday loan costs prominently to different borrowers on a randomly assigned basis. And they found that certain information, such as the total dollar cost, that, that the total, total dollar cost can add up over time, reduce borrowing. And finally, um, a different study also found that simple text reminders were as effective as financial incentives at helping consumers make their loan payments on time. So moving to the strategies that practitioners shared with us for implementing principle five, this include make it simple and automatic, embed financial education within other programs, products, or services, change the perception that of financial education training to make it valuable, um, and do a process map of your program to figure out where there is participant drop-off, analyze what could be changed to maintain engagement and follow-through. Okay, we're right at the end here. Um, just a couple pieces uh, uh, of materials that we've developed it, that um, you can use around Principle 5. Uh, one is a, a, a tip sheet for consumers on how they can get feedback on their spending um, in as close to real time as possible so they can best uh, stick to a budget that they've already determined. So again, trying to make the context um, in which they're making decisions be uh, supportive to them achieving their goals. And then lastly, just to note that we have a number of tax time savings resource, uh, resources, and tax time is a point when people are getting money. Often if they get a refund, they're thinking about financial decisions. And as easy as, uh, and the easier that you can make savings at that time, uh, the, better, the more likely people are to follow through. And so we have some worksheets to help for that. So you all have been very patient and listened to a lot of content and a long presentation. Um, but we are done with our presentation. Um, and I just wanted to put up um, on the screen so you can see um, the URL for the report, which is the first piece up there, um, the resources for financial educators webpage, which has 
Um, most of our resources, though, I'll be honest, we haven't yet gotten the principal's paper up there yet, but again, that is a, a gateway to most of our stuff. Uh, and then the email address um, for people to sign up for CFPB Finex if they would like to do so. We also have a LinkedIn group that we group that we put the uh, the address up there for. So um, we're going to stop there. And thanks again for listening. We hope this is useful. We'd be happy to answer questions, get your feedback either now or anything you ever want to send us. You can use that same email address. We check that multiple times a day. So hope that is helpful, and we'd love to hear what people think. Um, thank you both so much, Maria and Irene for the webinar. We're opening the Q&A to questions right now. So if you have a question, feel free to put that in the Q&A. I will mention that I posted the link to the uh, research report on the five principles. That's in the chat. So if you want to click on that, you can go straight to that. Um, so at this time, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A and we'll get to those. I did want to, uh, as I was looking at this, uh, one thing that really that really captured my attention was the key financial skills, Irene and um, Maria. And are there is there a particular list anywhere? I mean, I think those of us who work in personal finance have some ideas of things that we would note as key financial skills, but that might not be an all inclusive list. Do y'all have something related to that? Uh, yeah, I think the, the three skills we listed under principle three come to come to the top of our mind. This idea that you know um, where to look for information to help you make a decision, that you know how to process the information you have gathered, and then that you know how to execute based on that information. And and those those skills come from the financial well-being research as additional areas that we hadn't looked at before that are crucial. And you'll note those are not skills. They're not, you know, how to calculate an interest rate. They're not tied to a particular decision. It's it's how to do something, um, and you then apply it to each situation. So you all in your work, everyone on this webinar could probably could could as you, as you know, Laura, make a long list of things people should be able to know how to do. I think we didn't want to specify what those were because it depends on the person's goal and what they're trying to do. But the idea is the information needs to be made actionable, really, and the skills then support that. So. Um, if you guys have lists, we'd love to see them just to yeah. better understand how people are thinking about that. But we don't have uh, a, a list of specific skills beyond that, those type of skills that would apply to really any type of financial decision. And then would you real quickly also, we've mentioned several times financial well-being and uh, just maybe real briefly mention a little bit about the scale and um, how that can maybe be used to determine impact in a personal finance education program? Sure, I'd be I'd be happy to do that. Um, uh, and we actually uh, opted, you know, obviously our presentation already was quite long, so we didn't want to say uh, more about the scale. And there are whole webinars on the scale on the um, the uh, the Finex, the Adult Financial Education um, Research for, for Financial Educators webpage. You can also listen in great detail. But essentially, based on that definition that you saw, that box with the control of day-to-day -day expenses, um, uh, working towards long-term goals, uh, we wanted to figure out how to measure someone's subjective sense of that. So not like what's your credit score, what's your income, but how do you feel about how you're doing, about achieving your own goals, whatever those may be. And so um, there was a fairly extensive uh, research project with lots of validation and testing and whatnot that came up with a, a 10 question sort of survey uh, instrument that when you take, and there's very simple questions, again, not about number or data, numbers, data, whatnot, but about do you feel like your, you know, your finances control you? Do you feel like you have enough money at the end of the month? And very simple subjective questions that when you do the scoring, you come up with a single number between zero and 100. Um, uh, and that scale is being used, um, actually, we've done a large national survey, there'll be data coming out on that, it's being used by practitioners, it's being used by researchers because it's a way to compare across populations and interventions. Um, and, but I think what's interesting about it is not only it's a measurement tool, obviously, and that's what got the most attention initially, but what we've heard from practitioners is that the questions themselves are, are very useful as sort of a diagnostic or a conversation starter. So whether or not you care about what whether someone has a 46 or a, you know, or a 56 as a score, you ask someone, I feel like my finances control me, and that person says, oh yeah, all the time, you could say, okay, tell me more about that. You know, how can we deal with that? What would, what would, what would help that situation? And that as a 
sort of a diagnostic tool and a way to um, open up a conversation with people. Now, I know many folks on the on this webinar may deal in group situations, so you have to think about how to apply using that scale as a group uh, as opposed to one-on-one, -on -one, but it can certainly be done, and we do know of people doing that. So we encourage folks to look at that scale. It's on our website. Read more about it, um, and we will be developing more resources for practitioners on how to use it um, and ways in which people are using it already that are sort of forthcoming, mm -hmm. along with national data on well-being, which will be coming out in early fall, most likely. Thanks. We'll, we'll look forward to that, and maybe you can come back and talk to us about the data when that's released. Yeah. Uh, we use that scale here in Arkansas as well. We have a question or a, a comment in the chat. It says, thanks for the great summary. I'm curious as much of what you reported is to be as specific as possible with clientele to address their needs. I'm curious how we can create an evidence-based curriculum if the need is to be flexible to address each consumer's needs. Seems to be at odds. And she says, thank you for your thoughts. So there, that conflict of creating evidence-based curriculum that we can use with audience, but then also having it be flexible enough to meet individual consumer needs. Yeah, I, I think one one thought that comes to my mind is that you need to lay a foundation of knowledge for different types of decisions. So if you're working in a group setting with multiple um, clients that each have diverse goals and, and challenges, you could try to find what's common ground, right? What, what are the foundational knowledge gaps that as a group they might have that could start them on the right track to then tailor what you're giving them to their own reality. And that might be with starting with our budget, right? With um, uh, and, and looking at their financial reality and setting up goals. Um, but to the extent possible, we do, even in a group setting, I think encourage this idea of doing a needs assessment. Um, and then based on that, trying to tailor the, the curriculum to what you found through that assessment. Um, and, and maybe providing specific tools so that people can then after you've given deliver the curriculum, I uh, tailor the information and take additional tools depending on where they are and what specific decisions they want to make going forward. Yeah, and I'll just say I think that's a real it's a real tension that if you're offering a sort of somewhat fixed group you know class, it's harder to do that tailoring. But I mean, we'd love to hear back from people about ways that you may find to do that, or mm -hmm. some of the ideas Maria found are promising. But um, we know that all of you will have other ways to. Uh, to uh, to make this work too, we would love to, to hear that. I think keeping um, the flexibility that this is your curriculum and maybe this is what the diagnostic of your client's needs found, and then you might need to be flexible in adjusting, right? And saying, this is where I wanted to go, but a lot of the customers today seem to want to be going in a different direction. How can I adjust? Yeah. And I'm now going to do what uh, was suggested we do earlier. We've left our slide up for a bit for you to write down any of those things that are useful. But now we're going to stop the screen share, which the downside of that is we are now, oh, it's going to be Laura. Uh, yeah. We're going to loom large on your screen. Um, I guess now, now everybody's seeing us large, right? So we'll try to look, we'll try to look our best and answer any, any remaining questions you might have. So uh, any remaining questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A. You see there, uh, Bruce Nee said, great job, and you guys provided great info. I'll second, info, I'll second that. Thank you so much. Um, who do we contact if, if our extension professionals have questions about any of the things that you covered today? Or if they're looking for you, put some links up there to get some of the tools and resources that, that are available through uh, consumer financial protection. But if they're looking for something in particular, where do we, who do we contact about that? Well, my suggestion would be to email that CFPB underscore finex at cfpb.gov. Um, I check that box multiple times a day. Uh, if I'm away, there's other people who check it too. And I, I do try to respond. And so if there's any questions, for example, specific for Maria, who knows more about the principal's paper than I do, I can forward it to her um, or try to get answers. So I would, that's probably your best bet. Um, again, our general website, CFPB, uh, consumerfinance.gov, uh, is fairly easy to navigate across a lot of the tools, but there is an adult financial education page, that's the resources for financial educators page, you can get to right from the main navigation bar, where we've tried to put all the things we think would be useful for financial educators. Yeah. It needs some updating, so it doesn't have everything right now, um, it's about to be redesigned, but um, 
that would be a way to also to find a lot. Of, and we have an inventory of all of our tools and resources, which is on that page, which is one way to find stuff. That also needs to be redesigned. So uh, uh, everything is in flux. But um, again, if you have a specific question or say, you know, you want to ask, do you have anything on a particular topic, if you use that um, inbox that we ha have, have had up, uh, I would be happy to try to connect you to uh, whatever would be useful. And there's such a vast array of resources there. And I'll, I'll say not only for adult financial education, but youth and things on college spending and early childhood as well. Just a great wealth, wealth of resources there. Yeah, and I might just add, yeah, Maria and I are both on the uh, sort of the adult financial education team. We do have several people who do uh, K-12 or youth financial education. And the interesting corollary, you know, this, these principles kind of came out of the well-being research. The scale came out of the well-being research. There is also a youth corollary to that called building blocks to help youth achieve financial capability, which actually took the well-being definition and, and skills and all and looked at, uh, looked at sort of a literature review and, and again, discussions with experts to look at the underlying um, skills uh, and, and uh, skills and knowledge in a way for different, um, uh, in a child development perspective for different ages. So for, you know, kids sort of a preschool age from age three to six, uh, they don't need to know about interest rates, right? They need to understand um, impulse control, executive function, wants versus needs. I mean, not the word executive function, but you know, begin to develop executive function. Kids in the kind of six to 12 year old range need to learn more about financial socialization and uh, start to understand some of those concepts. And then at a high school level, they really think experiential learning is the most important thing. And so that's all laid out in this building blocks report. So anyway, and then there's some um, practical applications of that. So if anyone's interested in working with the sort of pre-adult pre population, there is a corollary to all of this, um, the, the building blocks report, which you can find as well. Thank you. I, I know many of, many of our uh, agents and professionals work with both youth and adults. We have another question that popped up in the Q&A. It says, uh, Suzanne says, thanks for the excellent work integrating all of the disparate concepts of effective financial education. There's some evidence of the importance of emotion in the financial education experience, like using music or photos, as mentioned earlier. Uh, is CFPB investigating this component at all? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. The way we're approaching it is by um, looking into a, a bit of our um, the emotions and the, the, the maybe the a bit of the rational part that comes into the way we make decisions, but we're approaching it from the perspective of family and money, how your family plays a role in the decisions you make as an individual, and we're developing tools to help educators and practitioners like you have those conversations with your clients, which at times are not easy to have, um, because the client themselves might not be aware or cognizant of how uh, other family members impact or friends impact their financial decisions. Or they may be cognizant, but it may be hard to change that. <laughs> Any of us right. with family members know. Yeah. Um, and that work is still, I'll just note, is still uh, under development. We've actually been testing it with financial educators who love it, but we can't share it we're just in, yet. <laughs> we're in the process of developing it. Yeah. 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 But I wanted to add, I, I, I think there is a lot of insight from the paper that could be added to the type of group setting that you, your, your practitioners like you are working on, um, such as this idea of, of follow-up reminders or, or peer learning um, groups to create motivation. Um, there is tension. We, we, what you, the work you do is challenging, but um, we, we hope that some of the ideas presented can help you um, find innovative ways to bring um, some of these other practices into what you're doing. Yeah, and Laura, I know we're probably right at the end here, but I just want to know these five principles, maybe maybe this is a closing comment, but yeah, these five important. principles came out of, you know, looking at the work that you and all of your peers do, but we're not saying that these are, you know, this is this is it, this is perfect, this is final. Um, I think the, the money emotion issue was a great one to mm -hmm. raise, and thank you for that comment. I mean, it, yeah. to some degree, it fits under motivation, but not completely, so... We would love to keep hearing things mm -hmm. like that, that, yeah. that, you know, we as a field might want to add into that set of principles or create additional principles. So I think we sort yeah. of invite ongoing exactly. research and discussion on this because we don't, you know, we, yeah. we certainly don't say that these, that this is, this yeah. is all there is. <laughs> tell, tell us about the challenges you see in implementing them or ways in which you are uh, using them. Right. Sure. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for today.
thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Irene and Maria. Uh, great information and a great job connecting with our extension professionals. Thanks for great. having Thank us. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it.